Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Bhagam Radian here in Orlando, Florida, covering the Air Force Association's annual Air Warfare Symposium. Uh, our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS, and it's our pleasure to be on the Lockheed Martin stand to talk to Greg Ulmer, Vice President and General Manager of uh, the world's uh, number one combat aircraft program, the F-35 Lightning II. Greg, uh, thanks very much for making time for us. Thanks, Vago. Good to be with you again. Uh, always a pleasure. We had an opportunity to see each other uh, at AFA and then uh, Royal International Air Tattoo uh, before then when you were kind enough to give us a great walk around uh, of the static uh, jet uh, that was there. Let's talk a little bit uh, about what you guys have on the radar screen. Obviously, one of the next big uh, elements of the program is going to be the performance-based uh, logistics contract, or at least you guys are making a case uh, to the uh, Joint Program Office that that's the direction we should be going in. Talk to us about, you know, for, the, for those in the audience who might not understand what performance-based logistics is, what it is, and why it would be potentially advantageous in this program. Sure, so we think about performance-based logistics, we're thinking over a long-term contract. So today, we contract annually, year over year. And that doesn't allow industry to make an, a long-term investment to, to bring improvement into the platform or onto the program. So the intent really of a, the simple intent of a performance-based logistics is to a five-year performance-based logistics so that the performance-based really are metrics in terms of improvement off-the-shelf satisfaction in terms of part availability, improvement of the diagnostic system, improvement of the uh, Alice now Odin system, those kinds of elements. With a five-year window, industry will bring a larger investment, think, think like $1.5 billion kind of investment, such that we'll buy into those elements to bring cost out of the program on the back end of that. To the benefit of the warfighter, to really get that cost per flying hour down on the program. Our target really is 25 by 25, and we've got to implement these kinds of projects to get that cost out on the back side of the program. And uh, where are you now? I mean, obviously cost per flying hour is very, very important, uh, uh, but people have still been signing up to the program even with a higher cost per flying hour. Where are you against that so the audience can help baseline where you want to get to of 20, which is $25,000 per flight hour by 2025? Yeah, right now we're around $35,000 per flight hour. But if you look at the work we've accomplished, so from FY15 to FY19, from a cost per flying hour, we've reduced that 44% in those four years. We just, award, we just got awarded FY20, the next annual contract, we reduced that another 10% in that offering to the government. In terms of cost per tail per year, uh, we've been able to reduce that from FY15 to FY19 down around 34%. And so we're on the trajectory relative to that. We need a larger investment, though, to bring the bigger cost savings into the program, and that's the advantage of our performance-based logistics. And, and what is uh, the uh, investment that's required to get the cost out? Because I think that this program holds a, a lot of lessons, and I want to ask you, in, in particular, some of the lessons where you know tiny little things actually have very, very big impacts when you measure them over time over such a gigantic program. What are some of the investments you guys need in order to be able to drive further down uh, that uh, logistics and sustainability number, and that's a topic that we've been talking about for a couple of years now. Yeah, there's there's several elements of what you would do to get that cost out. One is you, we need to get the organic depot stood up. So part of the, the performance-based logistics would be an incentive to the industry to get those depots stood up, such that you have a source of repair over and above um, just production of parts for spares and repairs. Another element is improved diagnostics. So let's, you know, no false alarm. So the, the diagnostic system on the airplane, let's not have a mechanic pull a part off the airplane that's really good. So let's refine and, and tune up those diagnostic systems. Another is reliability, maintainability improvements on the platform. So we have components on the airplane that may not be meeting their reliability projections. So let's go work and resource those parts, maybe re-engineer those parts. So there's, there's investment required to go do that work and that's where industry can bring a larger investment and have a longer period of time to earn that return back. And uh, uh, speaking about uh, sustainment base, reminds me, um, Turkey, any impact now? Have you minimized that in terms of dropping Turkey from the program in the wake of the S-400 decision? Is, um, are all of those potential sources of Turkish supply been replaced in the program at this point? And is there any cost impact as you've made that change? So we're on track relative to the resourcing of all that material. We're not complete, but we're on our plan relative to the resource of that material. Uh, as we resource that, there may be upward pressures. So there also may be opportunities relative to as we resource finding a, a cheaper source of supply. So that all hasn't played out yet. It still needs to play through to determine whether or not it'll be an upper or lower 
on the program. And, uh, and as you said, right, you guys did that with the DAS program as well, so you right. feel pretty confident that you guys can make uh, a shift like that. Where are we on the unit cost of the airplane, which is uh, another important metric? So we just signed, you know, in the, just in the fall, last year we signed block, the block buy, so lots 12, 13, and 14. For the CTOL or the A model, we got to an $80 million airplane at lot 13 one year earlier than planned. The lot 14 price is below $78 million for a CTOL. For the, for the C model, we're actually below $100 million for the first time on the program. We're right around $94.4 million on a C. And the B is just above $100 million. With the lift fan and the propulsion system for a B, it's a slightly more expensive airframe. Uh, do you expect to have more B sales at the end of the day? Because there are a lot of folks who are looking at this in terms of its capability and seeing it as an enabler, uh, whether it's Japan or a lot of other countries. Do you guys, at the end of the day, expect to be selling far more Bs than you expected? I think the, the, B, the B program will be, be larger than we think it is today. We've already seen the Japanese increase their program of record by, by 100 airplanes last year. In that mix is potential B model. We have other traditional A model customers talking to us about potentially more or additional B model aircraft in their mix. And I think you'll see new customers come to the program looking for a B model airplane as well. And uh, very quickly, let's talk about those uh, additional customers. You guys are competing in a number of places around the world, Canada, Finland, uh, Switzerland. Give us kind of a tour on what we expect to, s where, where do we expect to see you guys win the next big orders? So Canada is right on the cusp of submitting the proposal. We're ready to submit a fully compliant proposal, 88 aircraft associated with that. Um, the Canadians just pushed that um, proposal delivery on uh, uh, 90 days, but we'll, we're right there right now ready to present our proposal. Um, Finland, you talked about that, that's 64 airplanes. We just had two aircraft in Finland flying a flight demonstration. That's part of their requirement relative to participating in the program. That's, that's pretty near and dear. Um, and really uh, Switzerland as well. We had a flight demonstration last summer in country and we continue to pursue. So I think both those three are right on the forefront. Um, from the capabilities of the airplane, I think the airplane just speaks for itself in terms of the best from a capability point of view. And then from a cost perspective, the fact that we've gotten this airplane below an $80 million for a CTOL makes it extremely, if not the high, you know, most competitive, but very much in play with even fourth generation aircraft. Um, let me ask you uh, two last questions. One, um, you guys pride yourself that the simulators for the F-35 are also mission simulators that allow you to demonstrate a lot of the combat capability on the jet, obviously a single-seater uh, aircraft. But the U.S. Air Force and entire Pentagon is moving to this joint multi-domain command and control network. Talk to us a little bit about how your simulator suite plugs in, could plug in to allow network-enabled concepts of operations development. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you guys can't do publicly on the ranges because of the kind of capability everybody has to eavesdrop on it. So you've got to develop some of this capability in very, very secure and highly sophisticated training and simulation environments. Talk to us about how you're working that part of the equation because anybody you talk to here understands that a lot of those joint multi-domain command and control um, procedures, connectivity, will have to be tested in highly uh, sophisticated training and simulation environments. Yeah, so if we look at right now, we're working with the government on a joint simulation environment lab really to support today IOT and E. We can't test the airplane in the very high end flight, high end fight, just because of all, everything you just mentioned. So we're working with the government to get that lab stood up. But the intention is after that lab stood up is to use that kind of environment that we established in more of a simulation training environment. So t let's take the lessons learned in that approach and apply it more to a multi-domain, a JADC2 kind of environment um, for the airplane. And uh, last question on fasteners. Um, all the jets appear to have, uh, talk to us about the fastener issue. What happened? What have we learned? Does it matter? Okay. So the fastener issue, we had what we call co-mingling. So we had a mechanic grab items out of a bin, and then at the end of the day when he was done, he may have one or two um, fasteners remaining and he put it back in the bin. Unfortunately, he put it in the wrong bin. So what we've done to correct that is we have um, kitted all the material and presented just the required material to do the work. So think of an Inconel fastener requirement and there's five Inconel fasteners. He, he will get a bag with just five. So he won't be able to go put those extras in the, in the wrong bin coming out of that work. Then he has to inspect that work relative to what he did. In terms of, you know, does it matter? What we've done is we went and surveyed all the, all the airplanes in production and determined um, 
how many, what was the percentage of we had the wrong fastener in the wrong location and it was not high. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but think, think um, low percentage of mix commingled or fasteners in the wrong hole. But then we did an analysis and assumed every fastener was in the wrong hole. And in that assessment, um, the design limit life, the worst case design limit life that we looked at was 131%. So that's to say 100% is not design limit load for the airplane. Anything above that, you're bending the airplane. The worst case engineering analysis, assuming every fastener was wrong and we know that it wasn't, is 131%. So we have significant margin um, for the airplane. And, but do you have any idea how many airplanes this is affecting? Because there was some talk that it was all of them, uh, which then raised the question, how, how could that happen in a sort of a 21st century production line? Yeah, we don't know. We don't have the ability to go back in time. These aren't serialized components, so we don't have an ability to know factually unless we actually go inspect every airplane. So, uh, and, and so it was basically operator error over a prolonged period of time ultimately is what happened. Correct. Greg, thanks very much for joining us. We really appreciate it and best of luck on the program and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Vago. Appreciate it.